trying to pull them back a little bit. Um, lastly, I just want to touch on OSHA. Um, OSHA has in the past been, been somewhat collaborative in how they work with employers to ensure uh, job site safety. But they have very publicly advertised a much different approach, which is really enforcement driven. Um, they're focusing on finding worksite violations and issuing substantial fines instead of working collaboratively with us as employers to promote the overall safety of, of our workplaces. This is, is pretty clear in the construction industry specifically. This new approach is just another costly burden that we as a business uh, have to deal with and it really creates a level of financial uncertainty for us that, that really requires us to hold back in terms of, of any sort of expansion. Um, the other issue is right now when, when OSHA finds a violation on a work site, only the employer is fined for that violation. Um, I, I would encourage OSHA to look for collaborative ways to work with employers and employees who do have a level of responsibility in their own safety and the safety of those who they work with to, to come up with programs that will help to encourage that level of safety. Creating those types of programs instead of uh, seeking to financially cripple businesses to coerce safety uh, really, I believe, would result in safer workplaces overall. Um, so I would encourage Congress, again, to look at ways to help OSHA to return to their collaborative and cooperative uh, spirit of working with employers instead of the punitive approach that they are currently taking. Um, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share some of these issues. I do just want to point out, um, Vice Chairwoman Burkle, you're my congressional representative, and um, I'm thrilled that you are. And I remember in your campaign, you ran on, on the statement that government does not create jobs, business does. And, and it really is paramount that, that government realize that they are there to create the type of environment that we as businesses need to grow and prosper and contribute to the economy. And I can't thank you enough for allowing us to bring some of these things to light in, in hopes that we can resolve them and, and work together to help to restore our uh, economy. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much for your comments. Mr. Pollack. Good morning. Good morning and thank you for inviting me. I'm the president of Optimation Technology, which is a privately held ESOP owned company, and we are in the business of designing and building factories. Um, so that puts us in the manufacturing sector. And um, during the period from 2000 to, to, to late 2008, we grew the company from 50 employees to 350 employees. What we have discovered is that even, even when manufacturing um, isn't as strong as it could be if you have good automation and, and, and good tools, that you can keep competitive manufacturing going in the United States. And, and if you look at the statistics, of course, you know that Monroe County is a great exporter of, of all kinds of manufactured goods around the world. We can manufacture at Optimation things which are sold competitively all over China and Taiwan and Japan and Korea and Singapore and other places. So it, it, it is a good place to be here. Um, the difficulty, as you've asked us to talk about, is what is the government doing to hold us back? And um, that's what I'd like to talk about a bit today. I can remember distinctly the morning of July 12, 2010, and that was the morning I came into work early as usual, ready to get going. And um, I opened my mail from the day before, and there was a registered letter there from the Department of Labor, the U.S. Department of Labor. And in the letter, they had lots of big words, and they talk about administration and enforcement and Title I and how that they were established there to make sure that um, compliance was held. Now, it's not only the case that there's plenty of compliance issues um, going on at the federal level. There's lots of audits going on at the federal level. And this letter was announcing an audit of 
the Affirmation Technology Medical Healthcare Plan. The Secretary shall have the power in order to determine which person, if any person, has violated or is about to violate any provision of the title or regulation. Now, when I read that, basically what it said was that they were there coming to audit uh, our health care plan and that we had seven days to produce 28 documents and answer four pages of questions. And of course, we buy the health care plan from MVP or, or Excellus. We don't create the health care plan, but now we have to take all the books, read through, become experts of the health care plan, and we have seven days to respond to this or we're going to be subpoenaed and in violation. We asked for an extension. We were told that three days was the maximum extension you could have. Now, at that point in time, when I got that letter, I will be honest with you, that was the first time I actually seriously considered throwing in the towel, and I sent an email to my vice president, I said, you know, it's really not worth it, we should just give it up. This letter was the seventh audit we had received from a governmental agency in 2010, and we're only in July. We were in the middle of an IRS audit that had begun in May, and when the IRS auditor arrived, I said to him, um, first day we gave him 40,000 pages of transaction files so he could peruse through and start looking for things. How long are you going to be here? He said, six months. And, um, and then began, we gave him an office, we gave him coffee, we moved him in, began the ordeal. And um, every day I go down and he would ask questions and we produce more documents. Um, I will say at the end of the IRS audit, well, partway through I thought we were almost wrapping up. And he said, no, we've, we've talked this over. Um, we'd like to audit another tax year. Um, they did stay for five and a half months, at, at which point in time we got a letter from them which said that um, there were no findings and that and everything was fine. And in truth, um, we got through the Department of Labor audit as well and all the other audits. We had no fines and no punitive actions. And, and in truth, these audits were you know, put there really in compliance issues. They may have been looking to find money, as, as Becky has, has implied, but they didn't find anything from us. We are very good at responding to audits. We are very good at staying in compliance. We're very good at, at creating jobs and creating factories as well. But when our energy is sucked off to do things which are counterproductive to the business, essentially audits are just there to, um, to poke around and, and, and see what you've done wrong. And there's a mindset that's put in, into these auditors as they're trained that Businesses are essentially criminals. They must be doing something wrong. They must be abusing their employees. Otherwise, how could they be so successful? And I'll tell you that the reason we are successful is because our employees have my back all day, every day, and they do double and triple and quadruple what anybody would ever even consider reasonable um, in order to maintain the company. But we have to deal with the Department of Labor, and, and these are at the state level, of course, as well as the federal level, with the IRS, with the RISA, with healthcare, with 401k audits, with ESOP audits, with the Census Bureau sending endless forms to be filled out um, under penalty if you don't, with OSHA and other regulations. Sorbanes-Oxley has, has lowered down to very, very small businesses. We hire two accounting firms, one to provide counsel so that we can make sure we're in compliance when the audit firm comes in. And, and then we have to have the two firms duke it out is what really says in the regulations. So it, it isn't a simple business running a small business anymore. I estimate that even on that IRS audit myself last year, I spent 200 hours of my own time. If that time had been freed up to do marketing and sales and work with clients, we could have created six, eight, ten additional jobs instead of you know just dodging government bullets. And um, so I mean, I think the first piece that has to come down is we have to look at every regulation and say, is this reasonable, is it practical? But then above and beyond that, how many auditors have been hired? How large has the government bureaucracy been grown in terms of IRS and OSHA and other people in order to force compliance? And how much of that money that's being spent is counterproductive to growing the economy? Because not only are those people um, sucking off of tax dollars in order to get their paychecks, they are also sucking off of our backs and taking us away from the opportunity to grow our own companies and do other things. Um, I appreciate you listening to us. I don't have any great expectations, but um, we're going to survive one way or the other. We don't ask for handouts. We're not asking for support above and beyond. Let's be a little practical about how we go about this. Thank you very much, and thank you to all three of our witnesses this morning for your very um, compelling comments. We, we have had a number of these hearings in, down in Washington, D.C., and I have been so, and I know my colleague, Mr. Kelly, as well, have, we've been so um, 
profoundly affected when you listen to a group of witnesses who have run small businesses and the question was asked to all of them if you knew now what you if you knew then what you know now regarding regulations and all of the impediments to job creation would you have gone into business and would you have would you have done what you've done and each one of the members of that panel said no we would not and so we have reached a point in this country, and when I listen to your testimony, Mr. Pollack, what you went through with all of your audits, we begin to wonder what's happened to the United States of America and our free enterprise system and our capitalist system where we have an understanding that the government can't create jobs. It is the private sector, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the private sector that's going to get this economy back on track. It's the private sector that does the, hop, the job hirings and expands businesses and buys more equipment and improves their technology. So I want to tell you that uh, this subcommittee and our entire Oversight and Government Reform Committee is committed to doing that, to, to recognizing and understanding the impediments that stand in the way of businesses and their success. And we will do everything in our power to help small businesses do what they do best, and that is to create and grow a business, to work hard and be successful, because that's the American way, and that's that's the American dream for uh, and why many of you have gone into business. So um, with that, I would just like to uh, talk a little bit about your testimony, and then, um, so I will, um, I'd like to just start with the same question to all of you. Um, whether or not you would be in this business if you knew now what you uh, if you knew then what you know now, you can all answer and you can start. Uh, sure, I mean the answer is yes, I would. Um, and, and really, the rewarding part is is the employees in the in the company team. I mean, everybody needs jobs, and if I can be a catalyst to help that happen, then I'm going to do it. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, I am not the company owner, actually, but I'll speak for him, um, and I, I don't think that he would, would not be an owner of a business simply because of the ability that being a business owner allows you to contribute to your overall community through job creation and, and things like that. I think we as a company are very proud of what we do. Um, we're, we're just looking for some assistance in making it a little easier to do what we do. I think many people involved in small business are survivors and very creative and they're entrepreneurial and that's why they're doing what they're doing. So certainly, no matter the odds, uh, I think most would attempt to be successful. Uh, as the odds are stacked against them or uh, the those that actually are successful become fewer and fewer and certainly the migration of manufacturing jobs overseas in this country is is appalling and certainly manufacturing can be profitable and it can grow in this country and uh, but we have to have some uh, fortitude and we have to have some policies that help support that because manufacturing jobs are really generate on the order of seven other jobs. Once they're here, they're high paying. Optimex has high paying jobs. These are career jobs. You have cars, put your kids to college, those types of things. And uh, they're not all gone. They are here and they're actually growing. But we have to uh, uh, support that and it's not, we are not the adversary. And the adversary is the global market space and we're competing against countries with policies that make it very easy to manufacture. And uh, I certainly would be, I can speak for myself and my partner, we would absolutely do what we're doing with Optimex in spite of whatever the rules were, how ridiculous they were. But we, it would create impediments to our growth, and we may not be successful. But that's just the nature of an entrepreneur, not because it's, uh, we're being asked to do it. Thank you. I, I just do want to comment, Mr. Pollack, um, if this gives you any peace of mind, the uh, continuing resolution that we voted on last week. Um, did stop the IRS from hiring 10,000 additional employees, so we were able to defund those positions. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll uh, yield my colleague, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Medina, I, I think it's important because the general public uh, doesn't understand what we go, I'm an automobile dealer. That's what I've done for a living, and 
Somebody asked me two years ago, would you be in Congress? I said, absolutely not. I'm too busy raising my family and running my business. Uh, so I have a little bit of an idea what it's like to deal with OSHA and, and everybody else that comes into our business that has absolutely no investment but is a partner that we really don't need to have on our back. Uh, this this ITAR, because I've talked to other people in the same in the same type of businesses, kind of walk us through what ITAR is and what you have to do in order to compete and why it makes it so difficult for you. The idea is, if you would, because most people don't understand this, the idea is at the end of the assembly, this product could possibly uh, be, be a, uh, used by a terrorist country or be used in a military fashion, right? So you're responsible for every little piece that goes out somewhere into the world as to finding out where its actual end use is going to be. Is that is that a, a, a That's correct. correct statement? Okay. The example of that could be that it goes into a laser welding machine uh, that So that's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, if you just draw the dots, everything goes everywhere. I mean, if it's, so it's like, well, ultimately you can make weapons with a lot of things. You know, you need rubber bands to hold the paper and get, uh, you just, where do you stop? And so uh, you go through that, you ask those questions, you go back and forth to intimidate your customer and make them feel like they're having to divulge information they don't want to give you. And then you uh, quote the job, uh, if, if, if they, if you think it's, well, then you can't actually get the license for it um, until you get the order. And then once you get the order, you then go and ask for permission to sell if they're on that list. And they can say no. And so and it takes four weeks. So meanwhile, you've gone through the whole dance of going back and forth. You've th done the bid. You somehow miraculously got an order. Uh, they have to wait to see if you can move on the order. Or you have to wait till you can move on the order. And uh, then they can say no. So meanwhile, your customer has gone eight weeks through a cycle and uh, have to start over again because the U.S. government said that this manufacturer could not sell this to you. And, and so the, uh, uh, it's in how they make the decisions about what they, you can sell and what you can't, I really have no idea. And it's a, it is an absolute crapshoot. And I, it, it, we have decided, we, we do almost $20 million worth of business a year. We do almost zero overseas. Because, and we could sell overseas. We get inquiries all the time. And we said no because we don't want to have to deal with the government, the uncertainty of the government. It takes way too much extra work on our end. And so it's a, it's a we're probably $5 million worth of business a year that we're just turning our back on because of it. What, what, uh, what agency do you work with this? Who, who is responsible for the ITAR? Is it, who does it go through? Uh, it's, it's the Department of Commerce or the uh, well, there's a lot of them. I know it's hard. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. It's we. I'll tell you what. I was really fresh on this a year and a half, two years ago. We decided not to do this, <laughs> and so uh, and, and I, we, we uh, because we're not doing it. Uh, it's it's out of my mind, and I'm into growth in the, in the domestic market space. Yeah, and I think the uh, the bottom line of this whole thing is because you're in a business that you have an opportunity to sell a certain product or pieces for a product that's going to be assembled. You now have, because of, of this overreach, 
that decided not even to bid that business. Exactly. It's not worth the aggravation. I would assume that, in, like everything else in business, time is of the essence. The process that you have to go through would be a lot different than maybe a foreign competitor would have to go through. And plus, waiting for the licensing, waiting for the okay, it's just better for you. It's, it's the old story, you know. <clears throat> Don't worry about the mule, just load the wagon. And I think at this time, the mule's about ready to walk away. So, <clears throat> excuse me, but I, I appreciate your, your testimony. And I can tell you, the American public really has absolutely no idea what you're going through on this. Not only what you're going through with ITAR, but the other regulations. I think that's the one thing that we're finding out on a daily basis. That we have to find some way of amplifying this problem so that people understand. This isn't just you coming here and complaining because you can't compete. You're coming here talking about the situation that makes it impossible for you to compete. And unfortunately, it's your own country. So I, I appreciate you. If I can add one more thing, there's another part to that restriction that has to employment. We had uh, we had 130 people working in, at Optimix, and one was a part-time consultant Canadian. Because that person did not have a green card and was not a US citizen, uh, we had to put locked cabinets and create a whole uh, infrastructure of security for this dangerous Canadian consultant that we had working and um, otherwise we're in violation. The Canadian quit because she didn't feel it was appropriate that we go through all that expense in order to keep her employed. So um, and now most companies and in, in technology manufacturing companies will not hire anyone who does not have a green card or is a US citizen. There are a lot of very smart people who, are, who don't have green cards or are not U.S. citizens that could really help generate wealth in this country that we can't hire because we would have to put these infrastructures in. So, and it's, and it's <clears throat> most technology manufacturers, certainly in optics and many machine shops and uh, other places, are do some level of defense work. And if you do some level of defense work, you have this other barrier now that's in place. So th there's a lot of cost around this. I understand the reason for it. There is, certainly there's reasons before it, but the, the <coughs> The, the way it's structured is so ridiculous, it's actually impeding U.S. export. Yeah, I have friends in, in Meadville that do the same thing, and, and they're going through the same process and, and the same problems. But I think what, it, what really disturbs all of us is, who is it that makes up these lists? And what's the criteria for somebody being on the list or not being on the list? And it would be like me selling a car, and before I sell the car, I'd have to ask that person, is there any time in the future that you think anybody could possibly be getting in or out of this car that could maybe be a problem for the country. And if, if I couldn't answer that, I couldn't sell the car. So I, I really, I get it, and I, and I gotta tell you, it is the scope of overreach and over-involvement that's killing all of us. So I, I appreciate it, please. Don't give up, don't give us up, up on us. We're, we're not gonna quit until we get it fixed. Thank you. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> I have one last question, then I'm not sure if you have anything left. Yeah, I do wanna ask Ms. Mike. Oh, you, go ahead. You know, and I know uh, right now, because of the events in Wisconsin and around the country, there's a renewed uh, interest and, and often has become too polarizing between organized labor and the private sector. And, and I think that that's done a tremendous disservice to both sides. And I would certainly think that for, we're, we're interested in it. And i got to tell you, I have friends on both sides of it. I have friends that do both. Uh, the PLAs are something that a lot of people don't understand. I mean, people understand Davis Bacon. In fact, I think Bacon is a Republican from New York. Uh, and Davis was a Republican from Pennsylvania, so when people say, come on, these Republicans don't like unions, those are the two guys that started, and they're both Republicans. But uh, as we go forward, and I think we would all agree that bargaining <clears throat> is part of the practice, but bankrupting an entity is not. And if you can, because I know you're very concerned, and I read your, your testimony with the PLAs, explain a little bit what that does to you and your ability to bid on a job. You can bid a job using Davis Bacon, but with the PLAs, that's a, that's a little different. That's more exclusive, is it not? That, that's correct. Um, in, in fact, if we do bid a job that is a federal job, we're required by law to follow Davis-Bacon rules, which, which in essence means that we're paying union scale wages and benefits. And, and the whole principle, of course, behind Davis-Bacon was to level the playing field, if you will, from a wage standpoint. Um, so when, when we bid and perform work at the federal level, we do pay Davis-Bacon wages. Um, you don't need a PLA to level the playing field from a wage standpoint because you already have Davis-Bacon or if we're talking New York State, we have New York State prevailing wage. 
a PLA literally, as I said in my testimony, tells me that I cannot use my own workers. And, and quite frankly, we have crews that are um, supervised by very experienced foremen who work with these people day in and day out. They develop processes and procedures to make us the most effective and um, cost-effective contractor that we can be. And when we have to put uh, people who have absolutely no vested interest in the success of our business and in fact have a vested interest in the uh, shutting down of our business to eliminate us as competition to their signatory contractors, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of like asking me to swim through a, a pool of alligators and hope I don't get bit. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it, it's ridiculous, and and I will honestly tell you that if we see PLA language in a bid, we aren't going to take the time to even bid it. Can we bid it? Absolutely, we can. But it sets up a scenario that, from a business standpoint, is completely and utterly impractical for us. So we close the specifications and we throw them in the garbage. And unfortunately, that takes away opportunities from our current employees and takes away our opportunity to grow our business as a uh, using taxpayer-funded projects to do it. Could I, could I comment on that sure. as well? Sure. Um, we like, we like um, RADAC are a non-union contractor. We have over um, 200 journeymen. We have a New York State Certified Apprenticeship Program where we're bringing up um, 24 young men and women into the trades. We're one of nine out of 100 and something apprenticeship programs that's non-union in New York State. And we're one um, of the others. <laughs> and, um, you know, our, our principle and practice based on the regulations is that we simply do not bid any governmental jobs, whether they're local, state, or federal. Um, we, we, we find our business entirely elsewhere because the compliance issues are immense. It's not that we couldn't do it, it's just that it's not cost effective to stay in line. And, and in truth, every single um, governmental job that we've ever done, someone has guaranteed that we were audited. Um, the time spent was pretty humongous and, and, and so we backed away from it. So our position maybe is different than theirs, but, but similar. We just find other work. And, and we do as, as well, but quite frankly, in this economy, the private sector has not been um, building as much as, as they used to. So in many cases, we're forced to look to markets that we might otherwise avoid simply to stay in business. And the other thing, if you would just comment briefly, because I've been through OSHA uh, uh, audits. Uh, and again, it comes down to the public's awareness of what these mean. And I would, I've always been a little bit disappointed. I've been through some MSHA uh, reports, and, and I've looked at it. Remedial action would be something in my mind. If you find something wrong in my workplace, <clears throat> I want to make sure it's safe for my guys. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things our guys are supposed to wear, if our car's up in the air, they're supposed to wear a hard hat and goggles. Uh, yeah, I don't know that you can mandate or legislate common sense in the workplace. I think you can set guidelines. But at the end of the day, I don't know how you get one of the people that works for you to actually look out for their own good. So having said that, the remedial process is the one I think is lacking in all these audits. And we used to have something called the Voluntary Protection Plan, which, uh, which makes sense where you sit down and you talk about these possible uh, problems and, and how it would fix them. But I know with MSHA, when they come in and they do an audit, when the, most of these things, these are, there's no cost-benefit analysis. It's just, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, fine, fine, fine. And it doesn't, I don't think it accomplishes the same type of an effect that an insurance company coming in trying to help you to eliminate possible losses or dangerous uh, situations in your business to because they want they're actually there to do something with you to fix it. I get the feeling when I hear folks talk that the government comes in. The idea isn't to fix it; it's to find you. So let me know. Am I am I reading this wrong? I, I'm, in my little corner of the world. You're I knew reading what it, was it like. exactly correctly. In, in <clears> fact, <throat> you know, I, I will tell you that. Um, we recently had an OSHA inspector show up on one of our job sites, and um, you know this is an OSHA inspector that we have seen on other job sites. And and you're absolutely correct. As an employer, safety is paramount to us. You know we want to make sure that every one of our people goes home every night to their family. Nothing is more important to us. 
Um, we had an OSHA inspector who has been on a number of job sites, and, and we are a very safe contractor. We do not have a lot of issues. Um, but this OSHA inspector confided in us that the directive from above, from Washington, D.C., is that these inspectors are to go on to job sites and find violations that can result in fines. Be because my understanding is that it's because OSHA is sort of self-funding and they, and they need to generate the revenue to support all these additional inspectors and things that they have decided um, will be their approach to safety as opposed to the programs like the VPP program and, and things like that. So it's, it's a complete reversal from, quite frankly, what OSHA used to be in terms of being a collaborative agency. They are now simply looking for ways to generate revenue. And, and it, to, my, to me, that's counterproductive. Thank you. We, uh, we had OSHA in and we did have hear their testimony and we were able to ask them questions and we were uh, really struck by the fact that one of the uh, people, one of the members from OSHA was there and he mentioned the fact that employers will comply with OSHA regulations in order to prevent because a visit because they fear OSHA going on site to visit their business. And I said to him, fear, this is the United States of America, we shouldn't be fearing government agencies. We should be working with them, as you said, that to, to find and to ensure safe workplaces for our, for our employees. No one cares more about the employees than the employers. Not OSHA, but the employers. So uh, we were struck by the fact that, that the, it has changed from being a partnership where we're both trying to work together to ensure safety to this punitive trying to, to look for and find uh, for offenses. But I, th I, I do think it, to a certain degree, it goes back to the mentality um, that seems to be pervasive in, in government now that employers are bad and they are looking to um, profit on the backs of their workers at any cost. And I, I think until we change that mindset, quite frankly, um, partnerships and collaboration between government and business is going to be hard to accomplish. Well, then I think a good way to end um, our first panel here is to say to you, to all of you, and to all of the businesses in upstate New York, that we appreciate you. We appreciate your sacrifice. We appreciate your entrepreneurial spirit. We know that you're the job creators, and we hope you'll work with us to continue giving us the information we need so we can go back to Washington and begin to create an environment where businesses can do well, can be successful, and not be penalized for all of their hard work and their efforts. I want to thank both of, all three of you on behalf of uh, Mr. Kelly and myself. Thank you for being here this morning and sharing your testimony with us. With that, we'll conclude panel number one, and we'll seat our second panel this morning. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.